Y'all, let's take our Bibles and turn over to Isaiah 29. Isaiah chapter 29. We're seeing in this chapter how God is going to someday intervene over Jerusalem. We have, in, in beginning the chapter, we saw that God was going to intervene with judgment, but he was also going to intervene with deliverance. We're going to see a section now that talks about the power with which this deliverance is going to take place, beginning at verse 7. But before we look into this scripture, Clint, do you have prayer, if you would, please, before we spend time in the Bible? Let's notice verse 7, y'all. And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her stronghold and the distresser, shall be like a dream of a night vision, and it shall be as when a hungry man dreams, and behold, he eats, but he wakes, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he drinks, but he wakes, and behold, he is faint and his soul has appetite, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Notice how that Isaiah points out to us that when this day comes, and it's yet to come, there will be a multitude of the enemy. There will be vast numbers. That's why he says multitudes. Now, first of all, this word multitude is indicative of, of great numbers of people. But also built into this word is, is an important aspect. See, and it's talking about the tumult or the confusion, the chaos of the noise that will take place. I found it very interesting one time I was, I was watching a documentary. I think it was called Ghost Army talking about in World War II when we were crossing into Germany there was a unit of about a thousand who were put together and they were taken from all parts of the art world they needed artists they wanted musicians people like that and they made dummy equipment they used sound that was pre-recorded and it would make it sound like there and, and then of course they used radio transmissions that were false but they could project it to make it sound like there were great numbers of an army moving here and there and the Germans thought it was real that's built into this word multitude that that uh, Isaiah is talking about here. Now he's already referenced this. Go back to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And this is, this is where Isaiah is prophesying of Jesus Christ. But notice he says in Isaiah 9, 4, For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Talking about the noise and the chaos. Just a... If you're, if you're making notes, I'll just give you some... References, Micah chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Joel chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 14. Talks about this. 
these enemies will be in great numbers gathered against Jerusalem. This, this will be this will be a major scenario in what we learn will be the Battle of Armageddon. Notice there are two objectives mentioned here in verse 7. Ariel, which is talking about Jerusalem, the Lion of God. Some people translate it Hearth of God. And then also he mentions uh, against her in her stronghold. Now there he's talking about the original city of David. And I want us to see this in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 11 at verses 4 and 5. 1 Chronicles chapter 11 verse 4. David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, were. And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, You'll not come here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is the city of David. This is what Isaiah is referencing. They will be... They will not, not only be trying to take Jerusalem, but they know they've got to... They've got, they must reach into the heart of the city. Jerusalem, over time in history, we can see it in the historical books of Scripture, was strategically expanded to provide defense against enemies. When David overtook the city, we have what's called the city of David. Y'all, all, all we need to do is look on a Bible map, and it'll show us It'll have a little tiny sketch where the city of David was. And then in Solomon's time, the city was greatly expanded. And when we come, by the time we come to Hezekiah, there was further expansion. And what we know that Hezekiah did, and we can look at this in Scripture, was to bring water that would be fresh right, right down through all the expansion right into the most central part, the city of David. Look at 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. I sure hope this is the one I want. 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 20. Yes. The rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might, and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 30. Thank you for moving the pages. I like to hear it. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. Now, one way or another, the enemies of Israel knew this had taken place. They knew what Hezekiah had done. Isaiah is telling us in that time they know they're not going to only be able to, they, that they not only need to take Jerusalem, they have to get into the heart of things because they're going to be able to sustain themselves. So he's pointing out the water flow being diverted was going to make this possible. See, in that day, Israel's enemies are going to seek complete annihilation. The enemies of the Jews have, for millenniums of time, sought their destruction and never been able to. 
when that day comes at Armageddon, it looks like it's finally going to be accomplished, and we know that the Lord Jesus is going to deliver. But they are going to be between a rock and a hard place. Ever feel like you're between a rock and a hard place? Lots of times we do. God's going to deliver them. God takes care of us. Our spiritual adversary, the devil, seeks to destroy us. And we know that, that our Heavenly Father puts things into our path to test us. We know that. It strengthens us. It displays out of our lives that we're going to walk faithfully with God. It brings glory to Him. But we also know that there is that realm in which our adversary, the devil, goes after us to attack us. And whichever way we want to look at it, we have plenty of times where it looks like we're between a rock and a hard place. Our adversary, the devil, is not only seeking to destroy our lives, but to discredit the testimony of Jesus Christ. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, the roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. We're told that. Paul tells us, take on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against spiritual power. And y'all, that's going on even when we're sleeping. The destruction of these enemies are going to be like a passing dream, however. Remember, we're seeing that despite the fact they're between this rock and a hard place, God's going to deliver them. It says at the end of verse 7, it shall be like a dream of a night vision. Quickly dissipate. Sometimes it seems that a dream we have just goes on and on and on and on and we learn it's seconds. That's what he's describing here. Verse 8 is telling us that these enemies will fail to dominate and they will fail to incredible what seems to be true to them and what is actually going to happen will be two different things God is going to wipe out he's going to thwart everything about them. look y'all by Moses hand the Lord brought Israel right to the Red Sea and here comes Pharaoh and here's the Red Sea and it wasn't enough that there was this, this pillar by day and the cloud of fire by night holding them at bay, protecting them. They were still overwrought. So God parted the Red Sea and let them walk through. They're between a rock and a hard place. They were starving. They were thirsty. And what did God do? Gave them manna. Gave them water right out of a rock. Now most of us have seen water flowing down a mountain stream. But this was water right out of a rock, y'all. God's able to do that. I was thinking about Acts chapter 12. We've been in Acts in Sunday school. James has been imprisoned and killed. And the general feeling is... Good job. So, what does Herod do? He goes and he takes Peter, puts him in jail. And if we're reading Acts carefully, we're thinking, oh no. But what happened? People went to pray. God delivered Peter out of jail. God's able. When, when we think we're between a rock and a hard place, it may well be that we are. But that doesn't give us reason to throw up our hands in despair. It just gives us reason to turn and seek the Lord more for what he's going to do. And notice the end of verse 8. 
It says, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Just like the, the hungry man dreams that he eats and when he wakes up, he's still hungry. The thirsty man dreams that he gets something to drink. When he wakes up, he's still thirsty. God's going to do this. Look at Psalm 27 and verse 1. We probably quote it. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord's the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46. Look at um, another place. Look at Psalm 61, y'all. Psalm 61. To the chief musician upon Naganah, Psalm of David. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that's higher and I because you've been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I like what the ladies played for the offertory hiding in the fit real well. And that wasn't planned, y'all. Except God planned it. Now let's come back to our text. God's going to intervene here over Jerusalem. He's going to have just cause to do it. And here we need to notice. Look at verse 9. Verses 9 and 10. Stay yourselves and wonder, cry out and cry. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured upon you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, has he covered. Jerusalem, God is going to intervene here with, the, with judgment and then deliverance but judgment first remember because Israel will have and often did persist in their sinfulness to the point God said go right ahead this is what you want go do it that's what it's describing here now look back at chapter 6 of Isaiah Verses 9 and 10. Where Isaiah hears the word of the Lord saying, uh, Who will go? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. Verse 9 of Isaiah 6. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear indeed, but understand not. See indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted and be healed. Now, is God unfeeling and ruthless? No, that's correct. He is not. But what happens is, and what Isaiah is being told, Isaiah, these people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. That's the direction they're going to be allowed to go. But you're going to go tell them anyway. God's warning back there in Isaiah 6 becomes true. This is the condition that they had entered due to their persistence in disobedience. Now, notice in something moat for probably most of us, I don't know, it says in verse 9, stay yourselves and wonder. That is stay, delay, hesitate about what you know you need to do. Wonder means have doubt. Isaiah's put this in a command form, but because he's putting it in strong terms, 
here's what you're going to get. When you're not ready to do the thing you know you need to do, and the more and more and more you do that way, the more and more doubt is going to come upon you. That's what he's telling. Well, y'all, nothing's changed. <clears throat> When we find ourselves in a pattern of being reluctant to do what God wants us to do, we are going to wrestle more and more and more with doubt in other areas of our lives when it comes to knowing what God wants us to do. And more than that, being willing to do it. That's what he's indicating here. See, the better we know the Lord and walk with him, the more correctly we respond to any situation. In the military, people were conditioned to exact, precise, immediate obedience. That's the design. It's left up to that individual who's receiving the orders to say, yes, sir, go do it. Well, that's very much what God teaches us for our own lives as it relates to obedience. We obey what we know God wants us to do, and when we don't, it works in our lives. And it works against us. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Paul tells Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See how important the scriptures are to us. The more we endeavor in scripture, the more we're going to remove ourselves from this position of, oh, do I have to? I don't really want to, so I think I won't. God doesn't design that in us, y'all. And it's not healthy for a person who claims to know Christ the Savior to, to embrace the thinking that we've been set free and we can do as we please to serve the Lord or not. That's not what God teaches us. Now let's notice this next phrase in verse 9. Cry out and cry. That should be translated blind yourselves and be blind. I don't, I don't know why the difference in the translation, but if we look in the Hebrew text, Isaiah is saying from God, blind yourselves, be blind. That's what they were doing. They were persisting in, re, they, they were refusing, they were persistently refusing to honor what the Lord said. And it was, it was an intentional thing, everybody. Let's keep this in mind. We're not talking about the, the times in our lives where we just don't honor the Lord. We, and we're grieved in our own hearts because of it. We, we need to go before the Lord and confess our sin. We're talking about the person who just persistently, willfully says, no, this, this is what had happened. And now they're going to travel the path that they've laid out for themselves. The end part of verse 9, they're drunk but not with wine. They stagger but not with strong drink. There were physical, physiological problems in Israel. They were given over to drunkenness and all the licentiousness that came with it, all the unwillingness of leaders to make decisions that came with it and all that. So they, they had these problems. But notice what Isaiah says, but not with wine not with strong drink. And what's he indicating here? That the real bottom line issue was spiritual. They needed to correct some spiritual things before they were going to correct anything else. Seems like there's no end to the times in our lives where that we just have to stop and look in the mirror and catch ourselves and say, you're not walking with the Lord, Mike. You're not putting this in order in your life. Better get it done. 
Notice verse 10. The Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. Now he's talking to the people here, but notice the prophets and your rulers, the seers, he's covered. Covered meaning they aren't able to discern. They aren't able to figure out what's going wrong. Now that doesn't seem to process to us because every one of us knows good and well when we're out of tune with the Lord when we're not walking with the Lord when there's sin in our lives we've got to deal with it. We acknowledge that. We know so. We're willing to deal with it. We do so. These people had come to a point in time where that they had those who were in authority over them who had so walked away from honoring the Lord, they, they didn't even have the capacity to make right decisions anymore. That's how far they had gone. Now see, the, the warning out of this is, do not think it cannot happen to us. Don't need to have a show of hands, but how many of us have had times in our lives or we've just gotten so out of tune with the Lord that God really had to take a two before it to us. Well, I'll tell you all something. It's not pleasant. One of the worst experiences I can recall is a time where I had to deal with some bitterness. And I mean, it was eating me alive. But don't think that it can happen to us. That's why it's so important for us to be very, very, very consistent and routine with examining God's word and walking with the Lord and just making, saying things in prayer to the Lord is a habit of our day. Now, I want us to turn to Romans chapter 11 because there's something else that comes out of this. What was happening in Isaiah's time becomes a pattern for what Paul mentions when he is going through his preaching and as he writes to Romans. Romans chapter 11, look here at verses 7 and 8. And Paul's in a section where he's demonstrating God has had to deal with Israel, but he has not completely forsaken her because here's what he's going to do with her in time to come. But Paul says, Romans chapter 11 and verse 7, What then? Israel hasn't obtained that which he seeks, but the election has obtained it. The rest were blinded. Oh, really? Notice what he does. He quotes Isaiah. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And he goes on and he quotes the Psalms of David. Now, what's Paul pointing out here? What happened back in Isaiah's time was still happening. But notice as we go on in Romans chapter 11, Paul points out the fact in Romans chapter 11 and verse 11, God uses this to bring Gentiles, hallelujah, to salvation and provoke Jews to jealousy, which someday every heart of the Jewish nation will be turned to the Lord. What was happening in Isaiah's time? You think we can't learn from history? Right? Here's something to see. First of all, it happened to them. Second of all, God was at work to do something with it. And millenniums of time later, Paul says, well, let me tell you all something. Here is what has taken place. God isn't overtaken by surprise. And things that can happen thousands of years apart God isn't surprised by that. That's, that's an eye wink to God. He's the God of eternity, y'all. Somebody major for me 
thousands of years of the history of the earth and put that in relation to eternity. It's nothing. Let's come to verse 11. And here's another evidence that God was acting justly. They were going to reap the consequence not only of turning away from the Lord, but purposefully rejecting his word. Look at verse 11. And the vision of all has become unto you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who has learned, saying, read this. I pray you. He says, I can't, for it's sealed. And the book is delivered to him who is not learned, saying, read this, I pray you. And he says, I'm not learned. I can't read. First of all, to the person who knows how to read, to the, to the prophet, to the seer, to these guys, it's like a sealed book. Joshua sent a book to me one time and he called me a couple weeks later and said, well, Dad, have you read that book yet? It's really a good one. I forget what it was now. And I said, well, actually not. Oh, okay. I said, haven't even taken it out of the wrapper. Can't talk about it. It's sealed. I haven't cracked it open. And those who understood but had no grasp of what was in there were like people who had all the learning available, but the book was sealed closed so they had no idea what was in there. And we're dealing with that today too, by the way, just to make an applicable point. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people in a lot of places today who are gathering as we are and there are those standing up presuming and I'm not anybody's judge and I'm not the end of truth you all know that but they're presuming to preach the word of God and you all right there is as good as what they do now that's a fact I've shared with some some of the services some of the mail order stuff that, that's available to preachers. They can pay a fee and have their homily sent to them every week of the year. And there won't be two scripture references and the whole thing at last 15 minutes and they're done. Y'all might like that, I suppose. That's, that's the way it so often is. I want us to look at 2 Peter chapter 2. There are a lot of people who know the words of the Bible, but they do not discern the truths that are in it because they're spiritually discerned. Now, 2 Peter chapter 2. Look here, y'all. But there were, Paul has just finished telling us holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's how God delivered the scriptures to us. It was his book. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who secretly shall bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be spoken and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now for a long time lingers not and their destruction slumbers not that's happening it goes on in many places let this always be a place where the scriptures are upheld. The scriptures we seek to have our standard for how we live our lives and operate. Let it be a place that we realize we haven't reached perfection, but we are striving to honor God in the name of Jesus Christ in holiness. 
Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us these things are spiritually discerned. God has designed that those who are his people come to grasp the scriptures. They're spiritually discerned. And y'all, don't, don't be disheartened when we wrestle with a passage and can't figure out what it's saying. Join the club. <laughs> it's the spirit of God who teaches us, y'all. And one of the most uplifting things, and I, I'm pretty sure I've said this many times before, when we're reading something that we've read for the 110th time and finally it dawns on us what, how it fits together and we just say, thank you, Lord, this is great. That's God's spirit working, everybody. And when scripture comes to our mind and it compels us, to decide it compels us how we're going to conduct our lives that's god's holy spirit it isn't it isn't because we're so on top of stuff god's doing this let's finally look here verse 12 i want to say something about this the book's delivered to the person who isn't learned who can't read and it's delivered to him saying, read it, I, 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 I'm begging you. He says, I can't read, I'm not learned. God's Spirit convicts us, He exposes our sin. God's Holy Spirit steps on our toes. That's not pleasant. Scott, you don't know it, brother, but there are times you bring up points in Sunday school and I say, God, help me, I've got to get my act. Just, God's Spirit does this, y'all. Don't, don't be discouraged. Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Because the time will come when they will not give heed to sound doctrine. They will not listen to. Can you imagine Paul needing to tell Timothy that? They will not listen. They will heed to themselves teachers having itching ears and will be turned aside to fables. They will run after people who will tell them the things they want to hear. It happened in Israel. We have to be careful that it doesn't happen to us. We have to guard ourselves against that final place I want to see this morning look in Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 this has to do with chastening but I want to encourage us to take the same outlook at pursuing God's word in our lives and just, just seeking to make it our, our constant endeavor. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised by it. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame is turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Don't, don't be discouraged and be like the person who's going to give up. To a lot of people, the Bible is just another book. So often, what is true is there is a person who needs to know Jesus Christ as Savior. We want to take anybody that doesn't know Christ as Savior and invite them to Christ. For us, let's be encouraged. God is working to do things with our lives. We look into the scripture and we know with all our heart that the day is coming when God's going to do this to turn the entire Jewish nation to himself. We know that's going to happen. 
where we can take encouragement in knowing that when God says he is at work to perfect us, he is at work to turn us into people that honor him and bring glory to Jesus Christ's name, he's going to do it. And when he says he doesn't leave us or forsake us, we know so. So let it encourage your hearts this morning. Let's have prayer and dismiss. Donnie, you pray if you would and dismiss us. Father, we count the privilege of your behalf, your work, preach.